be your holy name. We worship you. We bless your name. For all you have done for us. Hallelujah. We are grateful. Oh, Lord. Raise your voice, say, for all you have done for us. Hallelujah, we are grateful. Oh, Lord. Raise your voice, say, for all you have done for us. Yeah, we are grateful, oh Lord, say we are grateful, we are grateful, oh Lord, raise your voice in this house and we are Make that promise this evening. One more time, sing. I will praise you from everlasting, everlasting. Tell him in good times and bad times. I will praise you from everlasting, everlasting. Come on, somebody, make a joyful noise in this house. Give Jesus some quality praise from the depths of your heart. Give him praise. Bible says I will enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praises. Who is ready to praise God in this house this evening? Oh, in heaven you are the Lord. Unless you reign it forever. Oh, Lord, I praise the heart. Blessed be your name, yeah, in heaven you are my king, on earth, oh Lord, I praise the Lord, yeah, blessed be your name, say in heaven, in heaven you are the Lord, on earth, oh Lord, you reign forever, oh Lord, oh Lord, I praise the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be One your name. One more time, say in heaven. In heaven you are the Lord. On earth, on earth, you reign forever. forever. Oh Lord, oh Lord, I praise our Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Yes, I 
yes, I, yes, I know he is. I've got a witness in my heart that he is. Standing on the right side, looking up my door. I can tell that I know that he is. Do you know he is? Yes, I, yes, I, yes, I know he is. I've got a witness, a witness in my heart that he is. Standing on the right side, standing on the right side, looking up my phone, I can tell that I know that. Say, do you know me? Yes, I, yes, I, I know. Hey, I'm gonna witness, a witness in my heart. Standing on the right side, standing on the right side, looking up my phone, I can tell that I know. What you say, she hold my love.
Lord, lift up your hands and begin to exalt the name of the Lord. We begin to exalt the Lord. Begin to exalt Him. Begin to thank Him for the life He has sustained in you. Thank Him for empowering you to be here this evening. It is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed. The compassion, they fail not. Thank the Lord because He's a God of compassion. He has been compassionate on all of His people. Else the enemy would have destroyed us for our incontinences. Begin to thank the Lord for bringing you here. Thank the Lord for even that which you are going to hear tonight, the word of truth that's, that makes you free. Thank the Lord because tonight you will be free from every bondages that self exaltation brings into our lives. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord because in Him, we trust that he will deliver us and not deliver through his word. The entrance of your word give it light and understanding to the heart of the simple, O oh Lord. As we are thanking you, mighty everlasting God, we pray that you release your word into the heart of your people, even as they will be hearing the message this evening. In the name of Jesus, let every heart be lifted up unto the Lord, not in vanity, but in righteousness, in love, and in truth. And in the name of God, we glorify in our lives in Jesus' name. We sanctify the atmosphere with the blood of Jesus. We ask the Spirit of the Word, the Holy Spirit, to take charge of this ministration. And in the name of the Lord, we glorify in Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's be seated in God's presence. We thank the Lord. Who have brought us here this evening. This is the midweek service of Rivers of New Water Ministries. A time when we share the word of God. A time when we learn at the feet of Jesus, our perfect teacher through the Holy Spirit. We have gathered this evening to hear how exhortation is regarded as a key to victory. Exhortation, key to victory. Amen? When the year of, my year of exhortation, I will be having lots of messages on exhortation. But this evening we are going to hear how exhortation empowers us to live a victorious life. Everything we do we must put God first. It's important that everything we do in life, God must be one first. And in so doing, you are honoring Him. You honor Him. Why are you honoring God? Because God owns you. He made you. He created you. So you must honor Him. The mere fact that you draw your breath from God deserves honor for God. He must be exalted in your life in the name of Jesus. Job 33 verse 4. Job 33 4 says, The Spirit of God had made me and the breath of the Almighty had given me life. Media will encourage you to please be fast. As I mentioned the scripture, please put it on the screen. It is the Spirit of God that gave us life. So that alone, deserve, 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 God deserves to be honored for that. And that is why God expects that you and I should live a life of praises, praises and thanksgiving. Psalm 150 verse 6. Psalm 150 verse 6. says, let everything that had breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. How many people that are here, even those of you who are online, praised God this morning before you stepped out from your bedroom? How many? I can see only two hands. Three, four, five. Oh, praise the Lord. Which means we are conscious of that 
important doctrine. God's word is commandment that we should praise him. It's his commandment that we should praise him. If you praise God, you are acknowledging him and he knows that you know the God that you serve. That is the God that empowers you to do great exploits. In fact, one way of praising God to ensure your victory is that you, sh- you must live a life of thanksgiving. You know, thanksgiving is a form of praises to, to God. Thanksgiving for what he has done for you in the past. And he will be moved to do more for you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. When you praise God, he is moved to jealousy over your life. That whatsoever is that stronghold that is in your life, God will deliver you from that stronghold in Jesus' name. The examples are replete in the Bible for those who praise God and God give them victory. Paul and Silas is one in Acts of the Apostles chapter 16 from 25 to 26. We are told that they praised the Lord. The sang praises in prison. They were in bonds. Many people of God are in bonds today, spiritually, even physically, facing trials and troubles of life. Instead of praising God, they murmur. They murmur. When you murmur, you belittle your God. You belittle your God. You should be exalting God in praises, in thanksgiving. Thank Him. In the time of adversity, He will save you. He's always there. Praise God. Paul and Silas, their chains were broken. They fell off and the prison doors flung open. Who did it? The Holy Ghost. The power of God came down and broke the chain. That every chain that binds you today, they are broken in Jesus' name. And you are free of that, of that bondage in Jesus' name. Victory also came for Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah over the host of Moab, Mansia, and Ammon. We all know the story in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 22. We saw how the victory came. God discomfited the enemies. These three great nations were risen against Judah. Judah, a small nation. Three great nations, Moab, Mansia, and Ammon. They would have overrun Judah if not that God sent ambushment upon enemies of people of God. And so the Lord will send ambushment upon your, people, upon your enemies today in Jesus' name. So apart from praising God, we have to go a step further. We have to go a step further in ensuring that we remain in God's presence at all times. Acknowledge that in His presence there is liberty. The God that gave you the liberty over the past troubles, He has not departed from you. As long as you are living a righteous life and you are in right standing, we have been preaching about righteousness, righteousness. Without righteousness, you cannot be exalted. You cannot be in that exalted position. Even if you are there, the devil will bring so many things to bring the person down. But that will not be our portion in Jesus' name. Our text this evening is taken from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 17. Our, title, our topic is Exhortation Key to Victory. Exhortation Key to Victory. And it's taken from 1 Samuel, chapter 17. We take it from verse 40. Read along with me if you are there. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag which he had, even in his crib. And his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine we are talking about here is uh, Goliath. We all know the story. And the Philistine came on and drew near to David, unto David. And the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. For he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. He disdained David. He belittled David. Whoever is belittling you is belittling your God. And that person forgets that you are carrying the atomic power in you. Praise God. The power that is greater than the atomic bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. You are carrying this three God in one in you. So Goliath did not know that David had this power in him. Praise God. So he belittled him. He disdained him. Verse 43. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou camest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. 
cost David by his gods. Of course, we know that cost costless shall not, shall not stand, shall not come. Praise God. Cost costless, cost costless shall not stand, it cannot come. So a cost from the hidden can never stand in your life. If God, if God has not seen any unrighteousness in you, even for the sake of his, his son Jesus, by, for, the, for the grace he sent to us, even when the unrighteous curse you, and you have some issues in your life, that cause will still not stand because you have not offended that unrighteous person. You have not offended the hidden. So that cause will go back to him. Praise God. So the cause of the Goliath here is like someone pouring water on a rock. The water will just flow, flow away without any effect. <clears throat> so the Philistines caused David by his gods. Of course, they are dead gods. And the Philistines said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air, and to the beasts of the sea, boasting, boasting. And said, then said David to the Philistine, Thou camest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Hallelujah. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thy head from thee. And I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the field of the earth. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Praise God. There is a God in Israel. And that is the God you and I will serve. Amen. If any man boasts, let him boast that he knows the Lord. David boasted. He boasted. And his boasting never, never got down in vain. Because in his boasting, he was, exor he was exalting God. He was, he was giving God the, the pride of place in the situation that was facing him. And we saw how God lifted him up and gave him the victory over Goliath. Praise God. When the Goliath comes knocking at your door, what should you do? Speak the word of God to that Goliath. And he will become like a, like a, he will become little. He will just become like a, like a dwarf. And he will fade away. Praise God. Verse 47. Say, and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. He did not say into my hands. Into our hands. He was representing his, uh, the, whole, the whole land, the, the whole Israel. Some people will want to arrogate the power to themselves. They want to exalt themselves because God, you know, they are in a position to, to do something. And you don't know that it is the, it's the God that has chosen you for a time like that. Just as, as a Mordecai was telling Esther in that book of Esther. He said, who knows, but I think God put you there for a time like this. Although it's a different story entirely. I just made that reference. Just for us to know that every situation you face, every opportunity you have to make an impact in the life of people Please seize that opportunity and make that impact without claiming the, the glory. David was already claiming, returning the glory to God even before, before God did what he was, he was to do. If David knew that God was going to do it. So he was walking in line with Hebrews chapter, chapter 11, verse 1. That talks about faith. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. He has already seen the victory ahead in the spirit. So he was already exalting God, thanking God, praising God before this enemy. When you lift up the name of our Lord, he will bring down your enemy for your sake in Jesus' name. Verse 48 says, And it came to pass when the Philistines arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slung it 
and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. Your enemies will fall to the earth in Jesus' name. You have the stone with you. We will come to that because he is our stone of help, Ebenezer, Jehovah Ebenezer. Praise God, our stone of help. How many people have Ebenezer in their lives? I have Ebenezer in my life. He is my stone of help. Amen? He slang. We had a warring prayer that our sister just finished praying now. The Lord should sling your enemy out. You should sling them. Awesome prayer. You are giving the battle over to the Lord. He said, the battle is the Lord's. You need not fight in this, in this battle. But the battle is the Lord. Verse 50 says, So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheet thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Hallelujah. David was just acting like God here. You know, he has boasted. He has already told the Philistine that, I will cut off your head, and I will feed it to the fowls of the air. He spoke even before he entered the battle. Are you that confident when you are in battle? Life is full of battle. Are you speaking to that situation that wants to exalt itself against the knowledge of God in your life? Are you speaking to it? If you have not been speaking to that ugly situation, please learn to speak to that situation. And the situation will bow to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in Jesus' name. You know, in, when, when David took those five stones and the sling, I perceive that he must have had at the back of his mind what happened when these same Philistines, the perennial enemy of the people of God in those days, and they are still enemies of the people of God. We, we can see what is happening in Hamas, with Hamas. Gaza. Uh, they are still enemies of people of God. They are still fighting Israel. So it's a lost battle for the Philistines. Just as they lost in the days of the Bible of old when the Bible was written by the Spirit of the Holy Spirit. They are still losing. Praise God. So he already, he already made that proclamation. That he's going to cut off the head of the Philistine. How he will do that, he already prepared with the stone and the sling. Because he knew that the power of God was in that stone. He did not depend on the stone, but he depended on the power of the Holy Spirit to achieve what he wanted to achieve. Exhortation, key to victory. He started by exhorting God. And God came along, went along with him in battle. Praise God. I said David had in mind, in mind the victory that God gave the Israelites in, in the time of in the time of uh, Samuel, in the time of Samuel, if you turn your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 7, 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, 1 Samuel 7, verse 12. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shem. And called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto had the Lord helped us. Hallelujah. We can see the origin of uh, the name Jehovah Ebenezer. He's your stone of help. That stone was an altar that Samuel, the judge, who was then judge in the land of Israel, of course, who was later rejected physically, but God was the person that was rejected by the people. Before God now gave them a king, Saul. So that Samuel was a judge. So he was the one interceding, interfacing between the people and God. So the people had requested that he continuously pray for them, for deliverance from the hands of these Philistines. A lot went on because the Philistines had been terrorizing the, the Philistines had been terrorizing the Israelites. So when this particular attack came, they did not know that the mighty hand of God was already there to deliver his people from the hands of the 
Philistines. Praise God. And when God wrought that deliverance, Samuel thought it good to erect an altar, put a stone at that point, and that they now called it, the Lord is my help. It's important for us, when God does something for us, let us erect an altar as a memorial concerning that particular victory that God has given to you. That altar can be in your heart. You'll be remembering God for that thing that God has done for you. Put God in remembrance. Put him in remembrance of everything he has done for you. When you do that, he does more for you. You bring it to remembrance. You bring him to remembrance. Praise God. So, as David used the stone as his weapon, he had in mind Jehovah Ebenezer, his help. Because ordinarily, stone cannot kill a fly. Because the stone cannot even catch the fly. How, have you ever thought how that stone went straight into the skull of the, of, the, of the Goliath? It did not just go to the skull. The power behind it was so much that it sank into the skull of the enemy. Praise God. That is the life of someone who the Holy Ghost is working mightily in. He will empower you to do great exploits in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 112, verse 6 to 8. Let's just open to Psalm 112. We are talking about exaltation, key to victory. And our text is from 1 Samuel 17, 40 to 51. But we'll look at Psalm 112, 6 to 8. Okay. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until you see his desire upon his enemies. You will see your desire upon your enemies in Jesus' name. God is telling us that we should not be afraid, we should not be moved. When the enemies come to attack, let your heart be fixed on the Lord. Trusting in him, 100%, if possible, 101%. Trust in him to, in totality. Don't look left or right. Know for sure that God will deliver you because our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Psalm 124, verse 8. Our help is in the name of the Lord our God who made heaven and earth. He will never fail us in Jesus' name. God will not fail us in Jesus' name. So we must learn to always put God in memorial of the past victories he made possible in our lives. When you do that, you are exhorting him. And he will exhort you in return. And when God exhausts you in return, he favors you with more victories in Jesus' name. Even much more than you are desiring. He gives you all-round victories in Jesus' name. Goliath's boasting was to ridicule the God that David served. Goliath trusted in his raw power to be able to overcome David because he had been defeating the Israelites in battle. One man with a, you know, can destroy up to 100 people within two minutes. It was as terrible as that. So he depended on his uh, raw strength. But the Bible has told us that by strength shall no man prevail. Is that not so? So do not ever depend on your raw strength in anything that you do. Depend on God. Depend on God. David expressed an attitude of confidence in God to deliver Goliath into his hands. He boasted in the Lord, like I said earlier. And say that from verse 45 to 47 of our text. He boasted in the Lord. And God exalted him. And gave him the victory. Gave the whole land the victory. So people of God, when we are challenged by the enemy with diverse troubles, we must learn to remember to cry to the Lord. As long as you are in a righteous standing with the Lord. Cry to the Lord. Because when Psalm 34, when Psalm 34, verse 17, of your Bible, Psalm 34, verse 17, says that the righteous cry, the Lord hear it and deliver them out of all their trouble. The word righteous cannot be removed from this scripture. Of course, but God has said that anyone that removes from this book 
His name will be removed from the book of life. So he can't even remove righteous from this particular uh, Psalm 34, verse 17. So righteous here is a key, is a key for victory to be secured. It's a key that you need for God to deliver you from that affliction. If you are crying, and that cry is from an abomin a, 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 a heart that is full of a, a, a abomination, or a heart that is not right before the Lord, the Lord will not hear that cry. Except it's for God's name to be glorified in your life and shame for the enemy. So by grace, you may hear that voice, that cry. But to be on the safe side, let us remain righteous so that when we cry unto the Lord, he will hear us and deliver us out of all our troubles in the mighty name of Jesus. A keen lesson we must, we must take from what happened to David in this uh, our text. David did not trust in the arm of flesh. Like I said, the arm of flesh will fail you. So he trusted and depended solely on Jehovah Ebenezer, his helper, to help him in that situation. He exalted God and victory came to him in Jesus' name. And of course, we also learn from uh, what happened in Second Corinthians at the time of um, um, Sennacherib's uh, boastings, his boastings against the people of Judah. I think it was in the time of, uh, of um, uh, Jehoshaphat. So when Sennacherib came to uh, wanted to attack, he, 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 he encamped against uh, the, uh, the people of God, Judah. And of course, God gave victory to Judah when, when, when the king, Jehoshaphat, with the entire people, cried unto the Lord. Praise God. Let's open to Second Chronicles so that we can see that story. Uh, but just, we'll just take two verses from Second Chronicles chapter 32. Second Chronicles chapter 32. Verse 7 and verse 8. 2 Chronicles 32, 7 and 8. Be strong and courageous, be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him. For there be more with us than with him. With him, with him is an arm of flesh. But with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battle. And the people rested themselves upon the walls of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Or it's Hezekiah, not Jehoshaphat. It's Hezekiah. Praise God. So uh, we saw what happened as God delivered his people. Now, it's important for us to know that exalting God helps us to grow our faith in God. When you exalt God, you are growing your faith in Him. Remember, the, open your Bible to 1 John. 1 John 5 verse 4, just to explain this particular point I'm, I'm trying to make. Exalting God helps you to grow your faith. 1 John chapter 5 verse 4. Praise God. Hallelujah. Okay. Say, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. The victory that overcometh the world is through your faith. Faith in who? Faith in the Lord. In, our, in the Lord who has given you the victory. So we must be able to express our faith in God as you exalt him. When you express your faith in God, it enables you to live in reverential fear of him. When you live in reverential fear of God, God intervenes in your, in your situation. He intervenes in your situation. And he, he lifts you up. The victory we are talking about is not just victory in battle. You can be victorious in your finances. You can be victorious in your spiritual life. You can be victorious in your prayer life. Because you are, you are exalting God. You are, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are worshiping Him. You acknowledge Him as your God. 
So your faith, you cannot even do all this without faith. It's impossible for anyone to please God without faith. That's Hebrews 11 verse 6. Six. So you must be able to be a child of faith for you to exalt God successfully. And when you have gotten to that level in your spirituality, your faith in God will enable you to hunger more for him, to seek to know the truth. Your victory lies in the truth that you know and that you do. Praise God. Your victory lies in the truth that you know and you do. It's not just knowing the truth. Do it. It is by faith you study the Bible, the Word of God. Without faith, you cannot study the Word of God. You cannot even understand because you don't know who God is. So an exalted life is a life of faith that enables you to hunger after the truth. The psalmist has told us that we should taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 34. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Verse 8. Praise God. Are you, test, are you testing for God? Are you testing for him? If you are testing for God, it shows that you are, you are, putting, you are, you are elevating him to the, to the height because he's above and you are beneath. So you must seek for him. You can only seek for what is above you. You don't seek to get what you already have. You are seeking for what you don't have. You are seeking for something, some, some gift from him. Exalting God enables you to, to operate with the highest regard for God. You operate with the highest regard for God. Why? Because he is the supreme being. He created you. He made you. You did not make yourself. Let's see what Psalm 100 verse 3. Psalm 100 verse 3. Praise the Lord. Psalm 100 verse 3. Say, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. So when you have that, that mentality, because you are a child of faith, you will give God all the glory for everything that happens in your life. You will not be like Nebuchadnezzar that was taking the glory to himself. Nebuchadnezzar stepped out of his palace, his comfort zone, and he was moving around with his eyes, physical eyes. He was looking at the beauty, everything. He was superintending over the whole of Babylon. He was the most powerful king. All this due to his own power. But what happened shortly after that? God sent him to, to learn from the animal kingdom. He took the throne from him. He took power from him. Because he did not exalt God. Praise God. He didn't exalt God. You see that from the book of Daniel. Daniel will not permit us to read it. Daniel, just write it down. Daniel chapter, tw uh, chapter 4. From um, 29, take it down to verse 33. You see how God brought down Nebuchadnezzar because he did not exalt God. He brought him down to the level of animals. He lost his kingdom, even though later he came back when he has fully learned. How many of us want to learn like Nebuchadnezzar? Yeah, we are shaking our head. God forbid. Yes. You must shout it aloud. God forbid. God forbid I will not learn like Nebuchadnezzar. Because it's a very hard and foolish way to learn. You must exalt the God that you serve, that made you. He made you, you did not make yourself. King Herod did not exalt God. God smote him with the worms. Worm ate him up. Because the people were praising him. And he did not say, not me. Oh. It is God, oh, not me. Oh. But he took the glory. And God is a jealous God. He smote him, and he died. 
So we can see it's a, it's a dangerous thing not to give God the glory. It's a dangerous thing not to exalt God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, if you look at Psalm 89, I'll be rounding up shortly because I want to create room for questions and answers. Psalm 89, if you take it from verse 15 down to verse 24, if time permits us, we read it up to 24. Psalm 89 from verse 15. You will see that this psalm personifies the life of one who has, whom God has exalted. Is the life of someone who God has exalted. He has lifted him up. The psalm he was writing this psalm. Let's, let's hear what he's saying from verse 15. He said, Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. In thy name shall they rejoice all the day, and in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. Somebody say amen. In righteousness shall you be exalted in the name of Jesus. Say, for thou art the glory of their strength, and in thy favor our horn shall be exalted. We can see that God will glorify his name in your life if you are exalting him. How is he glorifying your, his name in your life? By giving you the victory over that circumstance that have been troubling you. He is your strength. He gives you favor. Psalm 5 verse 12 talks about God blessing the righteous with favor, compassing him around with a shield. Favor is a shield. So you can only come if you are living an exalted life. Because he first loved you. You are also loving him. And because you now love him, he will exalt you. May we continue to have the love of God in our heart in Jesus' name. And in verse 20 of that Psalm 89, he said, I have found David my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. All this is because David has exalted the Lord. He has loved righteousness and hated iniquity. So God, his God, has anointed him with oil of gladness above all his fellows. That should be your portion. That's what you should be, hung, uh, hung, hung, uh, be hungry after. That God should anoint you with oil of gladness. So that when people are saying there's a casting down, you'll be saying there's a lifting up. Amen? Amen? That is when God has given you the victory through exaltation. With whom my hand shall be established, my arm also shall strengthen him. You can see that strength also comes through exaltation. Strength comes through exaltation. Now, let's, let's look at Amos. Briefly, Amos chapter 5, verse 9. Amos, Amos, Amos. Amos, Amos 5, verse 9. He said, That strengthened the spoiled against the strong, so that the spoiled shall come against the fortress. You can see that, that ordinarily you cannot come against the fortress of the enemy because the fortress is so strong. Physically, we may appear weak, but God will endure you with spiritual strength to come against the fortress of the enemy if you exalt God, if you honor him, because he's there to fight your battle for you. Spiritually, you will gain victory over the enemy, no matter how strong their fortress is. Praise God. Hallelujah. So that's what he's saying, that his hand shall establish him and his arm shall also strengthen him. When the enemy comes to spoil you, God will strengthen your hands in Jesus' name so that you will spoil the stronghold of the enemies in Jesus' name. The enemy shall not exert upon you, nor the son of wickedness afflict you in Jesus' name. Because the mouth of the Lord has spoken it, and the Lord will beat down all your foes before your face. And he will plague them that hate you. In the name of Jesus. God's faithfulness and his mercy shall be with you. And his name, in his name, 
your horn shall be exalted. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And in closing, I want to encourage us to always seek wisdom. The Bible has told us that wisdom is profitable to direct. In Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 10. Wisdom is profitable to, to direct. That's just the part of it that I, I need to take. You know, because if you do not have that wisdom, you'll be going round and round circles to get things done. Wisdom of God, of course, to get things done. So you must acknowledge the Lord, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 to 6. Acknowledge God in all that you do. When you're acknowledging God, you are exalting him. Acknowledge him and he will direct your path. He will give you the wisdom that you need to be able to live a victorious life in Jesus' name. The psalmist exhausts the Lord for his awesome powers because God wills his power in the life of his people through diverse miracles. God will will his power in your life through diverse miracles of deliverance in Jesus' name. So just write down Psalm 29, verse 2 to 11. Psalm 29, verse 2 to 11. Read it at your time. You know, it's a way of God bringing victory into the life of those who put their trust in him. Amen? Because you put your trust in the Lord, the Lord whom we serve will show forth his exceeding power, the greatness of his power in our lives, in and in the working of miracles in Jesus' name. And I decree that a decree, according to the word of God, that God's power will lead you to greater heights in Jesus' name. God will use his awesome power to protect us from all evil in Jesus' name. His truth shall be our shield and our buckler every day of our lives. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. That's the end of my message. I'll take questions from today's teaching. Or if you have anything that has been bugging, bugging you that you don't understand scripturally, just ask a question so that we can try and uh, answer it. Yes. Questions, okay. please. Uh, yeah. Uh, Pastor Chris, thank you for the message. Um, in the course of your message, you, you, you spoke about altars. And when we read, you know, especially the book of Genesis, we find out that from, from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, you know, at each, you know, severally they built altars. Um, so my, my question is, in, in, our, in our current dispensation, because you, you also mentioned that, that we need to build an altar to God. So how, how do we build how do you altar, build an altar? altar yeah. Given what you know happened in the days of Abraham and Isaac. Thank yeah. you, sir. Okay, but well, if you notice in the course of my teaching, when I talked about uh, Samuel building an altar of stone, made an, put a stone there, an altar, for remembrance of what God has done for them, the victory he gave them over the Philistine. And of course, David leveraged on that particular incident to now use the stone, seek for the help of Jehovah Ebenezer to help him. Now, altar is a way of exalting God. It's a, it's a way of creating a time for you to worship him, to worship God, to seek the face of God. That's what the, the, the benefit an altar offers you. Nowadays, our altar is not like what some churches we do, when they put the image of uh, Hail Mary, they put it, uh, they hang it somewhere in their bedroom or in their parlor or wherever. They consider that as their altar, as their place of prayer. You don't have to erect anything like that physically. Just designate a place as an altar where you pray, seek the face of God, commune with the Lord. I think it's in Psalm 4. So that's a, it's a, it's a, I commune with the Lord upon my own bed. I commune with the Lord in my own heart. I commune with the Lord in my own heart. So your communion with God is in your heart. 
Not that you are going to be murmuring something like, uh, you know, murmuring something in your heart. But God is in your heart. You are communing with God in your heart. I also mentioned that the altar you build now is, it should be in your heart. When God does something for you, create an altar for that thing, what that does is that it, enab it enables you to remember the good that God has done for you so that you just keep on thanking him for that past blessings. So your altar can be in your heart because after all, after all, it is from your heart that the issues of life come. That's, that's what the Bible says. But maybe mommy will help us more with this answer. But the question is, how do we build an altar in present-day dispensation when we are not in the time of uh, Abraham, uh, Jacob, uh, Samuel, who built physical altar? And I've told you that you do not have to build physical altar. Your altar is a spiritual altar that has forced you a place for worshipping God. Don't make a graven image of worshipping God, of communing with God. But those things are graven images that they place here, 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 here. God is a jealous God. Praise God. Maybe our mommy can help us now. If you want to build the altar to the Lord, first of all, remove the old altar you have already built. Either by yourself or your father or your mother, it has to be removed. And then before you can build an altar of the Lord. And it's not that you go back to the village and start destroying them. You can do it where you are, by, by faith. Whatever Satan does, he goes to the altar to make sure that it's properly built. We can take that example from the book of uh, Judges. Let's go to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. We look at the instruction given to, to God, to Gideon. Judges 6. We take from verse 23. Read it down to 26. Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. Take from 23. 23. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Joshua. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord, and called it Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day it is yet in offer of the Abyssalites. 25. And it came to pass this same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of bear that thy father had, and cut down the grove that is by it. That's the altar they have built before you were born. There's no very few Nigerians who will not have that altar because of the because of the way our parents said they have been worshiping idols and etc. And even when you are not there, your name is is is, is mentioned. You go straight. So the Lord said, before I can do anything, this is what I want you to do. The other has to be built. First of all, the old one has to be removed and destroyed. And then look at 26. And build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock in the other place. And take second bullock and offer a burnt offering with the wood of the grove which thou hast cut down. Now what is this saying? Not that we are going to go and start removing altar or whatever, but it's by faith. The blood of Jesus symbolized the blood of the animal that we spread call on that altar. And as then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was, because he feared his father's household and then the men of the city, that he could not do it by the day, that did it by night. Now, if you read it down because of time, eventually the, the altar of the bear was destroyed in 28. They woke up in the morning, the altar of or bear has already gone. So when you want to build the altar, first of all, you pray against the altar that has been built before you were born. And then now that probably you were also worshiping within the village where your parents are, and eventually now give your life to Christ, that altar must be built, must be destroyed, I mean. After destroying it, how do I now build an altar? By confession and repentance. And I'm telling the Lord, Lord, I have come right now to build another altar to praises and worship. And they will now tell the Lord that the Lord himself has already created an altar for us. And that altar is found in the blood of Jesus and the word of God. And as we go by faith and begin to praise and to worship him, because most of the time the opera, uh, uh, altar people, they do thanksgiving. They do praises. They do worship. Then before they start doing the sacrifice. The sacrifice... 
believers will do is not killing animal, it's thanksgiving. Because thanksgiving is a sacrifice. As you begin to thank him for the deliverance he has wrought and the thing he has given to you, you are no longer the same place you used to be. Now you have been elevated. You are now a new creature. All things have passed away, all things have become new. And then as you do that, you have already built an altar. And every night, every morning, you make sure you are reading your Bible and you are praising God, worshiping him and giving him thanks. It's an altar. And as you do so, you have already erected it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Mom. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's clap to the Lord now. Amen. Amen. Another question? We have the grace. We have a senior pastor here to, to give us more illumination. Uh -huh. So if it's, if it's something you need to come for counseling, you can easily ask your question here. You, know, you don't want to hide anything. Ask your question and you, you receive an appropriate answer. Except it's the one that needs a deliverance prayer. Question, question, question. Ask questions now. OK, with all heads looking straight at me like this, what is the topic of today? <laughs> what is the topic of today's Bible study? No looking down. Some people are already looking their, their notes. Uh, no, don't, don't let us talk uh, in thousands. Or just, we are bold enough. Stand up and what is the topic for today? No, not sit up again. I saw, I saw her looking down at her book. So, sorry, I'm exposing you. <laughs> Praise God. Exhortation, key to victory. Amen. Amen. And can another person tell us how do you exhort God? How do you exhort God? Just give us one example of how you exhort God. Okay. Thanksgiving, how? Just Thanksgiving, attacking him, you know, for because you are tall and then you have beards. <laughs> <laughs> Thanksgiving. <laughs> oh no man. Excuse my <laughs> Okay. Thanksgiving. Eh? So let me let's know now. Thanksgiving for what? Okay, Thanksgiving for uh, what he has done for us. Okay. Yeah. You said one. <laughs> <laughs> See, when you say thanksgiving for what God has done for you or for us, are you not being specific? You know, you, you, should, you should be thanking God. Say, Lord, I thank you for this, for that, for that, for your past mercies in this area, in that area. Eh? Okay. You are exhausting him. Yes. You are thanking him. I know, Lord, that you that did this, you will also do more. more. So, can, so, so, okay, you can sit down. Can someone give us an example of someone who exalted God by referring to the past victories in his life that God gave him. If you are bold enough, is beg you, you want to answer? Give us the circumstances. That's not just, not just a straight answer. Okay. Uh -huh. David walked in faith, and you said when we walk in faith, we exalt God. He referred to how he killed um, those wild animals and in the same faith, the God that gave him that faith to attack those wild animals was still exalting to defeat um, Goliath, and he did so. And that was why he was bold enough to tell Goliath he was coming after him in the name of the living God. Praise God. Okay. Let's give everybody the answer, the clap of friend. A clap of friend. At least if he didn't answer, he's able to clap now. uh -huh. Praise God. Amen. Since there's no other question, we would like to... Okay. All right. The one I wanted to ask, that's what Dickin asks. Uh, asks, Dickin asks. Uh, so you don't need to ask. So there's no, but this one that is bothering me, yes. as we know, we just entered New Year. I, heard, I knew that uh, Abraham... When he lost his wife, he bought a, a place to bury his wife and make it to be a burial ground. And what comes to my mind, why is it that when, jo when Jacob died in Egypt, he said he wanted to go back to that burial ground. 
and I want to compare it with this our some churches. Is it right for people, I mean churches, to get a better, a better ground? Because they don't want to bury outside their, I don't know, outside their country. Because I don't know why Abraham made it a mandatory that people, Isaac said, my father Abraham buried his wife there. And Isaac buried his wife there. Jacob buried, Jacob was saying, and he told them that if I die, please take me to that place. Then, when Joseph is about, he said, please carry my bone. Go back to that place. Now, some churches are buying burial ground. I was trying to ask somebody, is that right? He said, probably is to help poor people because burial ground is very expensive in this Lagos. Is that right? Why is it that some people want to go to their burial ground, the family, when they are died? Some dying in America, they carry them to Nigeria. Praise God. This is your question, eh? You got uh, plenty, plenty branches. <laughs> Praise God. Well, I will try the most I can. Abraham had a, Abraham had a covenant with God. He had a covenant with God. Uh, and that covenant underlines that God, through him, through Abraham, he will bless the seeds. He has made him father of many nations. And that's a covenant. So, and that, that, that covenant needed to work all through the generations after Abraham, third generation, fourth generation, seventh generation, it should continue to work. If you are outside that covenant, the promises cannot stand in your life. You may ask me, is the dead still within the covenant? No. We are serving the God of the living and not the God of the dead. To actually directly answer the second part of the question, while I'm, I will still go back to the first part, which is about why did the Abraham, um, Isaac and all of them take their dead body, Joseph, say, take my, uh, his, his dead body back to that place? Because it's a covenant. Of Abraham, that Abraham had. I might also ask, what, what land was that land where they were burying their people? Can you remind us? You that ask that question. What was that land? Where did they get it from? Eh? He bought the land. Yes. It became a family land, more or less. That land is where he agreed that that's like someone buying his burial, burial place in advance. He already paid for it. Well, you may say it's not right because it's God that decides when it's appointed for anyone to die. I will not buy my burial ground. My burial, my tomb, I will not. I, I don't consider it right. Let, let, let the, you know, the, the living will be the one to bury the dead. You cannot choose where you where they will, they will bury you. But ideally, ideally, it is not right for you to buy your own burial place. It is not right. Now, for the churches that are doing that, like I've just answered that it's a covenant that Abraham had and it continues from generation to generation. When Joseph died, before he died, he said, take my, you know, to that place. And all of them. So, but in the present dispensation, when churches start buying land for the burial ground, are we serving a living God or a dead God? We are not glorifying death. It's like they are preparing for, for death to take place. And when, you start, when they start preparing for death to take place in their midst like that, both the young and the old, the enemy will be attacking them. Some of them will die prematurely because they have already called in the spirit of death into the church. And it's not right. But to, personally to me, I don't think it's right. Because it's a way of inviting the spirit of death into that church. You cannot have a burial ground to bury members of a church when they die. It's not right. So maybe mommy can also help us. To give us. Or if any one of us has an answer. 
to add to that. Yes, I want to to, to yes. play another perspective to that. So yes. As, as you rightly said, Abraham had a covenant yes. with, with God, which, you know, will run down. But are you, are you saying that that covenant, as a that diagram also relates to that covenant? Because I, I know that there are, some, there, are, there, are, there are some people that, while they are alive, mm. while they are alive, that they say, if I die, they give their children instructions, say, if I die, this is where I will be buried. Understand? Yes. They, they give they, are, they give their children and you dare not disobey such such instruction based on you know what I've had based on based on what what I've had. So if 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 a father says when I die, like there are there are some people that give that give their give their sons instruction say yes. immediately I die, don't take me to mortuary, bury me immediately. And when such person dies, I advise the person otherwise. He said, no, yes. this was instruction that my dad yes. gave. So yes. my, my question is in two folds. Yes. Concerning Abraham that had covenant with God. Yes. Because when, when you read the book of Genesis, Abraham actually bought that, um, that burying ground, yes. understand, when his wife died. And the subsequent generation also you know, his children also buried that. Was that connected to the covenant that he had with God? And secondly, well, how do we put the people that die and say, if I die, bury me at this place? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay. You know, the covenants they cut out in the days of old is with blood of bulls and rams. Uh, I think it's in, it's in Hebrew chapter 9 or so where, where we talk about that covenant. That I'm looking for. Okay, now, Hebrews 9, verse 15. 9, verse 15. Say, and for this cause, he is the mediator of a new testament that by means, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Okay, so what I'm looking for, what I'm looking for has to do with the, when the Bible says that there's a better covenant. We have a better covenant, and that better covenant is sealed with the blood of Jesus. Okay, that covenant sealed with the blood of Jesus overshadows the old covenant that was based on the blood of animals. It overshadows it, so we should be looking at the better covenant. Jesus never told us that we should, we should be carrying our, our, our dead, one, dead loved ones from America to come and bury in the village or from America to come and bury in Lagos. You know, you can bury anybody anywhere. If somebody writes a will and says, this is my will, this is where you should bury me, that's the person's uh, wish. Oh, follow the person's wish. Please, follow the person's wish. Don't go against it. It's like you are going against somebody's will. To, to give a one night out to another person that his name is not appearing in the will, you are disobeying. So, to start with, we have a better covenant on the blood. You are at liberty. Now the Lord is our spirit. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We have liberty to do as we will, we wish, as long as it's biblical, as long as it's in line with God's commandment. What's the second part of your question again? No, you have, you have answered it and asking the person okay. that says, this is what I, I need to be done when I die. Uh-huh, okay. Uh, yeah, you said, yes. if the person says it in the will, it should, that the person's wish must be respected. It must be respected. Yes, Zapekin. Okay, thank you. Pastor, please, in answering the question on covenant, you said something, and I would like to be educated. You said, you asked if the dead are also are still in the covenant. And I thought that uh, the Bible said that those who die in Christ will rise up in Christ, will rise up again. I thought that was also part of our covenant, that the death of the righteous is not in vain. So if our covenant stops, when we die, does it mean that 
you are not part of the covenant anymore. If but the Bible says that well, those who died in Christ will rise up for him. It's not part I, of the covenant. I made that statement in the context of what Abraham did, okay. the covenant he did. It's okay. in context. You understand? The, even the person that died, the person, the, the, what they are bearing is just uh, in the flesh. The spirit has gone. It's the soul that goes for judgment. Huh? What will rise is the spirit, the spirit of, God, of the person to unite with God. It's not the body. So where the body is buried, it's, not, it's of none effect with that uh, Thessalonians you are quoting. When the dead in Christ will rise, and, uh, and so, it's not the body that will die, that, that will rise, it's, it's the person's soul that will go for judgment. Praise God. So, that, so there's no covenant in death. God is a God of covenant of, for the living. How you live your life while you are on earth determines how you end, whether in eternity with Christ or eternity with the devil. So it is what you do on earth that determines that, not where the person is buried. Mom would like to give us some... Sir, please. Just so okay, Pastor, Pastor yes, Lade, yes. okay. I just want to maybe just come from a different perspective. Okay. In, um, for Abraham and also for the church, you know? So for Abraham, another perspective is also people who are wealthy, who have um, a lot of money and they want to establish a legacy over a period of time, year after year, generation after generation. We even see it here in Nigeria, um, people who are also very wealthy. What they do is that they buy their land, they have the to tombs, because they, as someone who said, they don't want to be buried in a specific place. They have a specific place that they want to be buried. So in that, in that instance, honestly, I don't, think, I, don't, I don't see anything wrong with that. If somebody is, says, okay, you know what? This is where our family will be buried here. Yeah, anyone that comes in. And I think that's also what happened with Abraham. You know, that it's a legacy. And that's why even in our faith, it's, a, it's called a patriarch. Because not only was he buried there, his wife was also buried there. And then the children later on. And then also for churches who actually now have burial grounds. What I've noticed, I don't know about some, but there are some who, because they are not just small churches they are institutions that have lasted for years now we all know that death is inevit inevitable death will still come one day and land will not be um, always there so as one of their strategies or one of their plans in the faith is that you know what rather than members going to because right now, as you see it in Lagos especially, they are actually buried on top of other dead people. Because in burial grounds, there's no space. It's, it's full. If you even go to this Altan Cemetery in Yaba, you discover that it's so full. So what you do is that they dig out the bodies of even some people. So there are actually institutions who, churches, who actually have a lot of resources. And because of that, they decided that, you know, let's just buy land. So that when members, obviously nobody prays for anyone to die young, when they reach a ripe old age, there won't be any contest of where to bury them. There's places for them to bury them. So that's a, another perspective I wanted us to, you know, just have. Apart from, you know, I mean, there's also a perspective that people, people might say, oh, are you praying for us to die? No. I think it's also future planning. Planning 50 years, 100 years, 150 years, 200 years. That's a different perspective. Okay. Let, let mommy talk before we take this Bible story to another level. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let's hear the conclusion of the matter, please. Amen. 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 <laughs> mommy is already with the microphone. Whether you like it or not, once you are dead, you are dead. Whether they bury you in Sokoto, they bury you in Jerusalem, they even bury you in Abraham's tomb does not take you to heaven. The decision to make heaven and hell starts here or not, where you are alive. So where you are buried is not the issue. And it's not God who told Abraham to go and get a place. It's his own desire. It's not God. God did not say, go here, go and buy the place. That's where you'll be burying everybody. What I know personally 
there are things in the Bible when you know it does not conform to the word of God, you can change it as a human being. We saw the Zola daughters. When the Zola fat, the man died, the righteous man, etc. He didn't have any son. They're all girls. And these guys, they protested and went to Moses and said, all the labor of father labor, we're not going to get anything from you. Is it because he hasn't got any son? But we are his children. Moses now took it to God. God now said, what the daughters are asking you to do, go ahead and do it. He said, they are right. What you think is wrong, whether it's in the Bible or whatever, if you have the spirit of God, you can change it. Provided you, you know the right mind of God. For me, as far as I'm concerned, if you bury me in Jerusalem, I am there. If in Sokoto, I am there. I'm already gone. Where you bury me is not the issue. The issue is that I'm going up. I'm not, I'm not going down. Whether you kill 25 cows, it does not do anything. All the beauty, whether the coffee is billion or so, aunt will eat it. So there's no point at all. The only saving grace is that to make sure that when that thing happens, I go up, I'm not going down. Where the coffee goes to, it's not the issue. Praise the Lord. Amen. Did not somebody after uh, 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 Elijah did he not die? They bury him. They did not exhume him when they were buried somebody else and put. That's where the relation took place. The man got up. Please let us focus on the most important of our lives. Amen. That on the day of that rapture, we go and meet him. Where they buried you, don't bury you. We are we're not going to be buried anyway. We are going to go up in Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Do we still have time for more questions? I oh, want to call it a day. Don't, don't visit that question again because mommy has already answered. I'm visiting the question again. I just, don't. I just want to point out to Pastor La, La, Lade. Okay. Concerning what you raised, you know, there's a concern around what Pastor Lade raised. The legacy. No, not legacy. Okay. Because we now, we now saw a situation when one of those private cemeteries was taken over by a bank. Aha. Uh -huh. So yes, the receivership was appointed to take over the private cemetery. Ah uh, yes. <laughs> you know? So who are not asking? Say show, it's a show. Is it it's a show. to dig out of the bodies? <laughs> say show. Say show. Show. God doesn't like show. Let's say not show. show. So, let's stop showing, please. It's better to give that money to the to charity. The yeah, less privileged. See, a man who has been wicked, the murderer, etc., and then you know also you also attend a redemption camp. They now bury with those who are pastor. Does he make him a pastor? No. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Our only legacy that we live is that we died in the Lord, and that we are going to heaven. That's the legacy we live. We don't know where. It, 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 I think it's, it's in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. If you open to Ecclesiastes chapter 9, there's a, there's a, there's a scripture there that I, I, I fear God more when I, when I read that scripture. Ecclesiastes chapter, I think it should be chapter 9. Was Moses not dead? Did they know where they buried him? Did they know where, who buried him? Is it not God? <laughs> Did they know where they buried him? Uh, yes, it's uh, you know, it's talking about you know when when one is dead, the knowledge, your hate, your envy, everything about that person is gone. The person has nothing to do again with any matter under the sun. The person is gone. So even when you start to make a memorial about that person, you want to turn the person's dead body after 25 years, remembrance, memorial. It's all show. The person has become skeleton already. In fact, some skeletons have turned to dust. And then you want to, you want to turn the body again after 25 years, after 100 years, because the money is there. It is show. There's, there's no knowledge, there's no memory of that person again. It's forgotten. In the heart of the person's love, either the wife or the husband or the children, the memory may still be there, uh, but anything that is being done under the surface of the earth, by the time you call that person, person's name, is of none effect because the person is gone. Praise God. And even, even to even crown all, the reason why 
um, uh, um, not Abraham, um, Joseph, and then uh, Jacob, they, want, they don't want to bury in Egypt because of these uh, Egyptians. Because of their prohibition, the pagans, and etc. They are covenant. Why should that man be buried among them? That's the reason. Yes. Okay? So just, just know that Ecclesiastes chapter 9 from verse 5. From verse 5. Just take note of it. Uh, five, 5 to 5 to 6. He said, For the living know not, for the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward. For the memory of them is forgotten. Also, their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. So, like our mommy said, whether they bury in Sokoto or Jerusalem, it's of none effect. Praise God. Are you here? You've not given your life to Christ. You're online. You've heard the word of God. Exhortation, key to victory. You can only exhort God if you know him. And you have heard the benefit of exhorting God. He gives you victory. If you are there, you want to give your life to Christ, please repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I acknowledge that you died on the cross for my sin. Thank you, Jesus. Even as I come to you, just as I am without one plea, I ask that you have mercy on me. Forgive my sins. Wash me with your blood. Lord Jesus, I accept you as my personal Lord and Savior. Come into my life as I accept you. Remove my name from the book of darkness and put it in the book of light. I believe, Lord Jesus, that I'm born again. And now I'm a new creature. I pray for grace to remain standing in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. I congratulate you for taking that simple vow, prayer with me. Now you are born again. You must not look back. What God expects of you is to acknowledge him in everything you do, live a righteous life, and depart from iniquity. And God will exalt you in due season in Jesus' name. Praise God. Always uh, worship with us. You have the uh, details of uh, the church services on the screen. Please take advantage of all the services of the church. Even as you continue to worship with us, the Lord will continue to plant your feet in his house in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's join our feet and round up with a very short prayer. We're going to pray just one prayer point. One prayer point. You need to examine yourself where you are standing. What is your status? What is your exhortation status? Are you truly exhorted, seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, as Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 has told us? and had raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Are you? Why are you examining yourself? It's because sin and iniquity might have brought you down without you knowing. Examine yourself. If you are in iniquity or sin, lay it at the feet of Jesus. Say, Lord Jesus, I cannot afford to move away from that exalted position. Help me to be righteous always. Pray that prayer. Lord, keep me in that exalted position. In any way that I've fallen from grace to grass, Lord, I ask and pray that you grasp me in again. Bring me back again to that exalted position. So that the victory that is allotted to those who are exalted will be mine. God said he will be merciful unto, unto all for our unrighteousness. 
and our sins and our iniquity we I remember no more. That's what God says. Remind him, hold him on his word. Even though you have been filthy, now the Lord has promised that he will no, no longer remember your sin and iniquity. Lord, take me back to that exalted position. That when the enemy comes to attack, I will resist him, set fast in the faith, and he will flee from me. Because I'm submitting to you. Thank you, Lord. Even as we're walking out of this auditorium, Father, we ask and pray in the name of Jesus that whatsoever will threaten our exalted status, they have you to contend with in the name of Jesus. Be it the curse of the world and whatsoever the enemy brings our way, help us to be alert in the spirit so that we will not fall prey to the wives of the devil. In the mighty name of Jesus, where it has been difficult for us to have the victory, is it in our finance or in our marriage, spiritual life, our ability to pray or to make us giant in the, in the, in the spirit realm, Lord, increase that power in us in Jesus' name so that we're able to do exploit in your name in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Holy Spirit divine, we thank you. As your people have spoken to your ears, so do unto us in Jesus' name. And let this, the, the glory return to the living God in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen and amen. Praise God. Let me sit there briefly. We will take our offering. It's offering time. If you've come for the Bible studies, please bring us a good offering unto the Lord. If you are online, you can make an offering, transfer to the account of the church online. Details on the screen. Make your offering by transfer to the church bank account and the Lord will honor your, your prayers. Lift up your offering to the Lord. If you are in the auditorium or wherever you are, lift it up unto the Lord. Begin to thank the Lord. It is the Lord God that has taught us to profit. Father, we thank you because out of our profiting, we have brought this token to you. We pray that you accept it as a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving in Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Your name is a strong tower, Jesus. To you belong all power, Jesus. Whenever I call your name, Away. Your name is a strong tower, Jesus. Yeah, your name is a strong tower, Jesus. To you belong all power, Jesus. Whenever I call your name, you make a way. Your name is a strong tower, Jesus. the Lord, even as we are coasting home now, let us please remember that this Sunday we are going to gather, gather again, 7.30 in the morning for our first service, and along the line, during the three services we are going to have on Sunday, the second being 9.30, the third being 11 o'clock, we are going to have a Thanksgiving session, Thanksgiving service, it's the first, it's the first Sunday in the month of February. The first Sunday today is 31st. as the last day in January. January has just come like a wind. It's gone. One out of 12. It's gone already. Praise God. In a fleeting moment. And so God will keep us safe and secure even as we go through the rest of the 11 months of this year successfully in victory in Jesus' name. So when you are coming on Sunday, come in your best native attire to dance to the Lord, to give glory to Him, to exalt Him. And as you do that, greater victory He will give to you in the month of February than He gave to you in January in Jesus' name. Invite your loved ones, bring your friends and wear with us when you are coming and the Lord will do great and mighty things for us in Jesus' name. Let's praise the Lord. Why we okay, like we know the prayer request on the, the table, the present table, 
is prayed upon by our senior pastor every day, virtually. And especially each time we gather together. Please, let's back her up in prayer. Extend our faith to join with her faith. So that every prayer, this is the last prayer that is going to be made on this, on this prayer request. This is the very last prayer. Because this is the last time we are going to gather together as a church. So stretch your hands towards the uh, uh, prayer request and begin to pray. Thank the Lord for the grace of God in the life of the senior pastor, first of all, whom God is using to bless us. And then thank the Lord for the life of everyone who have written the prayer request. That God will grant them speedy answer to their prayers. And testimonies will never depart from this house. In the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name we are prayed. Amen. So why we, we take the charge, the charge. Psalm 75 verse 10. Psalm 75 verse 10. Okay, it's not going to be on the screen. Please don't put it on the screen. So let's, let's go. Psalm 75 verse 10. Let's go. One, go. All the hands of the wicked also will I cut off, but the hands of the righteous shall be established. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord will exalt all our hands in Jesus' name. Where the enemy have been riding roughshod over us from today, because the Lord has exalted our hands, we will ride roughshod over the enemies in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we are prayed. Amen. Let's share the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore in Jesus' name. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever in Jesus' name. Amen. Service is over.